Good evening. Um, it's my honor to introduce the third lecture by Professor Gareth Evans, the Humanitas Visiting <laughs> Professor of Statecraft and Diplomacy. And his um, subject tonight is eliminating nuclear weapons, a hopeless dream. I should say that that ends with a question mark. Uh, and he has revealed himself in earlier lectures as an optimist. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of his career. I'm just going to draw attention to two positions that he has held, I think, which are particularly relevant to this topic. He's been president of the International Crisis Group, um, the conflict resolution body from 2000 to 2009, and was co-chair of the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament from 2008 to 2010. I thought I'd just make three brief points by way of introduction. The first is to emphasize the importance of the topic. I think we would all agree that a nuclear exchange, let's say, between Iran or Israel, India or Pakistan, India and Pakistan, uh, or an act of nuclear terrorism is still the sort of event that could fundamentally alter our view of international security. And I'd make two further points, maybe posing them almost as questions. Um, of course, the NPT Treaty has been relatively successful in restraining the spread of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons technology, I think more so than its original signatories imagined. Where is that initiative heading in the future? And thirdly, you know, is the nuclear zero option realistic? Is it a window that still remains open? bearing in mind that it has been um, advocated by some very heavyweight international figures, including, surprisingly, both George Shultz and Henry Kissinger in their article, A World Free from Nuclear Weapons. So on that point, over to Gareth to dive into these issues. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Richard Dealer, for that very generous, nice introduction. And thanks to so many of you for staying the course uh, for this third lecture. I'm touched and amazed in equal proportions that so many of you are here. Of all the international policy issues with which I've been involved over the last 25 years in the various roles that Richard mentioned as, well, first of all, Australia's foreign minister, but then as head of the International Crisis Group, and then also as an initiator or member or chair of a number of so-called Blue Ribbon Commissions and Panels. No issue has tested my optimism more than nuclear disarmament, an issue that in earlier times, earlier decades, mobilised hundreds of thousands of activists all over the world, and on which every leader, every policymaker had to have some kind of opinion, now, frankly, barely resonates at all with policymakers or with publics, except when there's an occasional flurry of anxiety as to what a North Korea or an Iran might be up to. So progress on disarmament has, as a result, been glacial and shows no signs of moving faster anytime soon. Nine nuclear armed states share the current global nuclear weapons stockpile of just under 18,000 warheads, with a combined destructive capacity between them, equivalent to around 120,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. The United States and Russia, who together hold 95% of those warheads, have been downsizing their arsenals, but in neither case with any intention of getting even close to zero. The UK and France, from much lower starting points, have made significant reductions in their arsenals, uh, which will continue in the case of the UK, with the current state of play being around 225 warheads in the case of Britain and um, UK and 300 in the case of France. But neither of these two countries has shown any more enthusiasm than the big two for moving to actual elimination. Israel, with its 80 or so warheads, although of course it doesn't admit to having any of them, um, can, I think, be presumed to think likewise in terms of the elimination objective. And the four Asian nuclear um, states, uh, 
China with some 240 warheads at the moment, India and Pakistan with around 100 each. And now we have to unfortunately add North Korea with something under 10, have been actually increasing their arsenals, albeit again from very low bases as compared with the United States and Russia, with no evident willingness at all, in their case, to change course. Part of the reason for the non-resonance of this issue and the general inaction does seem to be complacency. The perception that in the post-Cold War world, nuclear stockpiles are not the threat they might once have been. Another part of the explanation seems to be ingrained fatalism. The perception that nuclear weapons cannot be uninvented, they're always going to be with us, and that there's little point in playing Don Quixote. But perhaps the most important part of the explanation for government inaction is this tenacious perception in many quarters that disarmament is actually undesirable because nuclear deterrence works. All these positions can and should be contested. And I'm enough of an optimist to believe that if enough hard information and good argument is put into the global public domain, if enough bottom-up civil society pressure and peer group state pressure is maintained for long enough, and above all, if there's enough top-down leadership shown by states and heads of government that matter most, and President Barack Obama's continued strong commitment is absolutely crucial in this respect, then I think significant movement can occur. But I can't pretend that ridding the world of nuclear weapons once and for all and ensuring that no new nuclear weapons are ever built will involve anything other and very slow grinding through very hard boards for a very long time. In this lecture, I want to explore in some detail the relevant arguments for elimination. Acceptance of which arguments is a necessary condition, even if it's never likely to be a sufficient one for disarmament. I'll then rather more briefly describe the present state of play in terms of the take-up, the acceptance of these arguments, and conclude by sketching some possible ways forward, which might do at least a little bit to accelerate the process. When it comes to making the case, the arguments for elimination, there are five crucial messages that have to be constantly and relentlessly articulated in public policy discourse. These are, first, that nuclear weapons are morally and environmentally indefensible. Second, that as long as any state retains any nuclear weapons, they're bound one day to be used. Third, so long as any state retains nuclear weapons, others will want them, so multiplying the prospects of such use. Fourth, that nuclear deterrence is at best of highly dubious utility and at worst zero utility in maintaining peace. And finally, fifth, that nuclear disarmament is actually achievable. So, the first message, nuclear weapons are morally and environmentally indefensible. Nuclear weapons really are simply the most indiscriminately inhumane weapons ever devised. Shocking in the extent of the devastation they cause. Shocking in their total inability to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, between young and old, between victims and those trying to help them. Shocking in the longevity of the human impact they have. As the International Court of Justice uh, determined, for all these reasons, their threat or use, quote, would generally, not always and happily, but would generally be contrary to the rules of international law, and in particular, the <coughs> principles and rules of humanitarian law. It's, of course, not just the countless men, women and children who would be vaporised, crushed, baked, boiled or irradiated to death by nuclear weapons in any nuclear war. The wider environmental impacts are similarly shocking, with even a notionally contained regional nuclear conflict having the potential, and Richard hinted at this in his opening remarks, having the potential to cause mass starvation worldwide. Just a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, in which, side, in which each side attacked the other's city with cities with, let's say, 
50 in total. Um, comparatively speaking, low yield Hiroshima sized weapons. That's not a totally implausible scenario given the history of warfighting between those two states, given current and continuing t tensions, given the size of each of them stockpile, and bearing in mind, although 50 weapons, nuclear weapons sounds a lot, there are 18,000 of these things out there in the international stockpiles. But such an exchange, quite apart from the devastation caused to the, those two countries themselves and all their major cities, would throw up enough concentrations of soot into the atmosphere which would remain there long enough, a decade or more on some of these calculations, to cause unprecedented climate cooling worldwide, the global winter effect, with major impacts as a result on global agriculture, the nuclear famine effect, so-called, putting at risk on at least one well-informed recent estimate, the lives of nearly one billion people. Second message. So long as any state retains nuclear weapons, they're bound one day to be used. The most serious risk with regard to nuclear weapons is not so much actually deliberate, aggressive first use by state actors. No nuclear armed or putatively nuclear armed state and I include both North Korea and Iran in this assessment, is likely, other than in a situation of extreme existential threat to its existence, to break the international normative taboo against the aggressive use or threat of use of such weapons, which I described in the first lecture in this series. Nor is there a very high risk although it's certainly not negligible, and the implications would certainly be catastrophic, as Richard again said, if this, if this happened, but there's not a very high risk that non-state terrorist actors will steal or buy existing weapons or manufacture new ones. The huge attention that has been paid to nuclear security issues since 9-11 has really resulted in much more stringent internal measures uh, being in place in nearly all the relevant countries and much more international cooperation in intelligence, in prevention, and in enforcement. The greatest risk from the existing nuclear weapons, and this risk is in fact much bigger than publics and policy makers tend to assume, is their accidental or panicked use as a result of the ever-present potential for human error, system error, miscalculation, misjudgment, under stress. Most people have no conception of either the size or the vulnerability of the current global nuclear stockpile in this respect. Of the 18,000 warheads in existence, 9,000 of them Russian, 8,000 United States with about 1,000 for the other nuclear armed states combined, nearly 5,000 of those weapons remain operationally deployed. And really quite extraordinarily when you think about it, in a world where the Cold War ended more than 20 years ago, some 2,000 United States and Russian weapons remain on dangerously high alert, ready to be launched on warning in the event of a perceived attack within a decision window for each president, each head of state, of some four to eight minutes. That's why they carry around these footballs and codes and keys and all the rest of it it's still going on. Nuclear deterrence may or may not be useful in maintaining the peace. I'll argue in a moment that it's not, but there's certainly a lot of continuing dispute about that. The point I want to make just for now is not about its utility, but its fragility as a safeguard of anything. For a start, nuclear deterrence depends on there being rational actors on both sides, each making rational judgments about the risk factors involved. And the presumption seems to be, in this respect, as Hedley Bull, famous Australian international relations theorist, once famously put it, that a rational strategic man in this context is one who, quote, on further acquaintance, reveals himself as a university professor of unusual intellectual subtlety, unquote. It simply can't be assumed in the stress of a real-time crisis that that kind of rationality will always prevail. Then add to the endemic risk not only of human uh, error, miscalculation, misjudgment under stress, the risks of miscommunication. Here now compounded by the sophistication of new generation cyber weapons and the risks of basic system error with harmless events being read by the systems in question as threatening. We've in fact been much closer to catastrophe 
more often than most people know. Over the years, technical glitches have triggered real-time alerts. Demonstration tapes of incoming missiles have been confused for the real thing. Communication satellite launches have been mistaken for weapons launches. As recently as 1995, when Russia's President Yeltsin was told that a, what was actually a Norwegian um, scientific rocket launch was an incoming US nuclear missile. Mercifully, he was both sober and rational at the time and said he wanted to wait and see whether that could possibly be the case before he responded to the advocacy of some of these advisers to press the button. As Cold War archives are opened, ever more horror stories from that period are revealed. They come in all shapes and sizes, but it's hard to beat, I think, this one from the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. We know now what we didn't then that nuclear warheads were not just on their way by sea to Cuba, with the issue being whether a blockade would be sustainable. But nuclear weapons were actually already installed in significant numbers on land and in Soviet submarines cruising local waters. When one such submarine came too close to a warning depth charge from a blockading US naval ship, the Soviet commander, not knowing whether war had broken out or not, and with his communications knocked out, had to decide whether to launch his nuclear torpedo, nuclear tip torpedo, at the nearest available target, which happened to be a huge US carrier, USS Randolph. In such a situation, under threat or perceived threat, out of communication with Moscow, he was empowered to do so provided he had the consent of his political officer on the boat, who agreed to fire the nuclear torpedo. But the commander of the four-boat fleet, who happened also to be aboard that particular submarine, had the power to override the two officers. So it was that by a one-to-two minority vote, World War III was avoided. Well, given what we now know about how many times the supposedly very sophisticated command and control systems in the Cold War years were strained by mistakes and false alarms and human error and human idiocy, given what we now know about how much less sophisticated are the command and control systems of some of the newer nuclear armed states, given what we both know and can guess about how much more sophisticated and capable cyber offence offense will be of overcoming cyber defence in the years ahead. It's really not the quality of systems or quality of statesmanship that's led us to avoid a nuclear weapons catastrophe for so long, but sheer dumb luck. And I think it's utterly wishful thinking to believe that our Cold War luck can continue in perpetuity. Third message. So long as any state has nuclear weapons, others will want them. And if more states get them, all the problems that I've just described will be further multiplied. The NPT Treaty has been successful, as Richard said, far beyond the expectations, really, when it was first negotiated in the late 60s. But it needs to be strengthened. There's a long agenda of measures that need to be taken to strengthen the regime, including the universal adoption of a safeguards regime, which actually allows nuclear inspectors to be not just accountants, more or less mechanically recording the flow of sensitive materials through power plants to ensure the non-diversion for military purposes, but real detectives chasing up leads about undeclared facilities, weapons programs. Other necessary measures include effective penalties for non-compliance with or withdrawal from the NPT, non-existent at the moment, strengthened export controls, and acceptance of multinational nuclear fuel supply arrangements. But unless the non-nuclear armed states perceive the nuclear armed states to be taking serious moves toward genuine disarmament, None of these necessary measures are any more likely to take wing in the future than they have in the past.
It may be totally irrational for countries to say you're not disarming fast enough, therefore we're going to drag our feet on proliferation measures. But let me tell you, that kind of bloody-mindedness is absolutely par for the course in international discourse when people feel that they are confronting double standards. The core message, accordingly, to every one of the existing nuclear armed states must be this. If you're serious about non-proliferation, as you all claim to be, if you sincerely want to prevent others joining your club, you cannot keep justifying the use of nuclear weapons as a means of protection, a necessary means of protection for yourselves or your allies against other weapons of mass destruction, especially biological weapons, or against conventional weapons. All the world hates a hypocrite, and in arms control, as in life generally, demanding that others do as you say is not nearly as compelling as demanding that others do as you do, or asking that others do as you do. Message number four, and what I want to spend most time on, nuclear deterrence is at best of highly dubious utility and at worst of zero utility in maintaining stable peace. This really does go to the heart of the case for nuclear weapons elimination. But it's a very difficult story to tell because so many policymakers instinctively disbelieve it. There remains a very widespread perception that nuclear deterrence actually works, that it's of real value to the national security of nuclear armed states and their allies, and that its benefits outweigh any possible costs, and that for these reasons, no more than lip service should be paid to disarmament. But all the major arguments in favour of nuclear deterrence have on closer examination absolutely nothing like the force that they're usually seen to possess. And this is true, whatever the context, whether it's the context of major power adversaries of roughly comparable size and resources, as with the classic dyads of US Russia and US China, or whether the context is so-called extended nuclear deterrence, where a major nuclear armed state extends the retaliatory protection of its own nuclear arsenal to allied states, as with the US and its non-nuclear NATO and Asian allies, including my own country, Australia, or where the context is that of a state of unequally small size and resources as compared to one or more notional adversaries, where it acquires or retains nuclear weapons with the object of raising the other's pain threshold at least high enough to ensure that the would-be regime changes or territory acquirers or punishers would think again. The kind of rationale we've obviously had from North Korea. I should say at the outset on this issue that in all of this one should not confuse nuclear deterrence with arguments about deterrence generally. There are many contexts in which credible deterrence will be crucial in maintaining, maintaining peace and stability or avoiding other unhappy outcomes. I for one have long believed that a mix of deterrence, of containment and also keeping the door open for negotiation is the right policy combination to embrace in relation to the world's anxieties about North Korea and now Iran. I've also got no doubt that the United States' willingness to hold its protective umbrella over South Korea and Japan has been and will continue to be um, critically important in discouraging them from joining the ranks of the nuclear proliferators. But effective deterrence simply does not have to involve the threat or use of <coughs> nuclear weapons. Extended deterrence in the context of ally protection does not have to mean extended nuclear deterrence. Manifestly strong conventional capability could do the job. There is a twist to this tale in that when strong conventional capability becomes perceived as overwhelming conventional capability of the kind that the United States has as against everybody else, although for how long remains to be seen, this may encourage others to retain or acquire nuclear weapons as a, strate as a strategic equaliser, a deterrent against conventional attack. This is the kind of thinking which is now making Russia and China rather reluctant disarmers as against the US, and Pakistan a reluctant nuclear disarmer as against India. But that takes us straight back to the issue with which I now want to deal. Just how credible are the familiar arguments, these included, for nuclear deterrence. 
Well, for a start, there's the argument we hear all the time that nuclear weapons have deterred and will continue to deter war between the major powers. An issue that I discussed, some of you may recall, in the first lecture in this series as to whether the, the long peace since 1945 has really been a nuclear peace. But while nuclear weapons on the other side have always constituted a formidable argument for caution, and undoubtedly concentrated minds in crisis situations like the Cuban confrontation, one can say this for a start, there's simply no evidence that during the Cold War years either the Soviet Union or the United States ever wanted to cold-bloodedly initiate war against the other at any stage and were only constrained from doing so by the existence of the other's nuclear weapons. Now Richard in his previous incarnation might have a different view about the evidence on this, but that's the evidence I've seen. There was never at any stage any disposition of either side to actually go to war, which was just constrained by, my God, we can't do that uh, because of the mutually assured destruction dimension of the nuclear deterrence, nuclear reality. It's also to be said, I think, reinforcing this, that we know that it's the case that knowledge of the existence on the other side of supremely destructive weapons in the past, as with chemical and biological weapons before 1939, has not stopped war in the past between major powers. Nor has the experience or prospect of massive damage to cities, massive killing of civilians, caused leaders in the past to back down including, I think one can now say, in the cases of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where despite the routine judgment that's been made for decades that it was the atomic bomb that at least brought World War II to a rapid close and avoided massive further casualties in any Allied invasion of Japan, it seems to be now overwhelmingly the case on the historical evidence that it was not the nuclear attacks which were the key factor in driving Japan to sue for peace. They weren't seen as anything more, particularly more destructive than the firebombing of Tokyo and many other cities which had preceded them. But rather, it was the Soviet Union's declaration of war later that same week. It's that that made the difference. True, of course, the, the context was different to the one we're presently talking about. There we, we were talking about terminating a war rather than deterring a new war starting. Uh, nuclear weapons defenders have been at pains to point that out. But the basic point that I guess I'm making in this respect, and it's a point that I guess one might expect remembering those psychological experiments I referred to in the opening lecture, policymakers really can be quite deaf and blind to risks staring them in the face, both when it comes to cutting losses and when it comes to trying for initial gains. Then there's the argument that nuclear weapons will deter any large-scale conventional attacks, that you need nuclear weapons as a, a protection against overwhelming conventional force. But there's a long list of examples where non-nuclear powers have either directly attacked nuclear powers or have not been deterred by the prospect of their intervention. Think about the Korean War, Vietnam War, Yom Kippur War, Falklands War, two Afghanistan wars, the first Gulf War. The calculation that was evidently made in each case was that a nuclear response would be inhibited by the prevailing taboo on the use of such weapons, at least in circumstances where the very survival of the attacked state was not at stake. The confidence that seems to have moved some smaller states like North Korea to think that a handful of nuclear weapons is their ultimate guarantor against external regime change motivated intervention. Although that's undoubtedly what they believe, it's really not very objectively well founded. Because weapons that it would be manifestly suicidal for a state to use are hardly a credible deterrent nor are weapons that are not backed by the infrastructure, for example, nuclear missile carrying submarines, that would give them a reasonable prospect of surviving or surviving in enough numbers to mount a retaliatory attack. In the case of North Korea, its strongest military deterrent, and it's quite real, its strongest military deterrent remains what it's always been, the capacity in particular to maintain uh, 
to mount a devastating conventional artillery attack on the environs of, of Seoul. There are also cases where the presence on both sides of nuclear weapons, rather than operating as a constraint, as deterrence theory would lead you to believe, has in fact been seen in practice as giving one side the opportunity to launch small military, smaller military actions without serious fear of nuclear reprisal because of the extraordinarily high stakes that would be involved in any such response. Think of Pakistan in Kargil in 1999. Think of North Korea in the sinking of the Chenan and the shelling of Yongpyong Island in 2010. So it may be that rather than as the old conservative line would have it, that the absence of nuclear weapons will make the world safe for conventional warfare, it may be that the presence, it's the presence of nuclear weapons that has made the world safer for such wars. There is in fact in the literature very substantial quantitative as well as anecdotal evidence to support what's known as the stability-instability paradox. The notion that what may appear a stable nuclear balance actually encourages more violence under the shelter of that nuclear overhang. On top of all these sorts of arguments, there's a further deterrence argument that nuclear weapons will deter any chemical or biological weapons attack. <coughs> This is claimed by some nuclear armed states and their allies, in particular as the reason why Saddam Hussein did not use chemical weapons in 2003. But I think it's an argument that lacks plausibility. In the case of Iraq, there are a number of other reasons why the Iraqis may not have used these weapons then, including a perception that coalition forces were well protected against such attack and a fear of individual force commanders of being tried for war crimes. That's two reasons that have been suggested for some credibility. But more generally, given that chemical weapons have nothing like, nothing like the destruction, destructive potential of nuclear weapons, I mean, they're alarming, they are properly described as weapons of mass destruction, but they're simply not in the same class as nuclear weapons and they never will have that impact, although I have to say the potential risk factor is much higher with biological weapons. But more generally, given this, it's, it never will, um, sorry, it's difficult to paint any plausible scenario in which nuclear, as distinct from conventional retaliation, would be a proportional and necessary and therefore a credible response. The US made no nuclear threat against Iraq and there's no evidence whatever that it would have done so or would have needed to had Saddam's forces actually used chemical weapons. And I think it's similarly inconceivable, we'd all agree, that the US, whatever other response it may choose to make, it's inconceivable that it would see any need in the context of current claims about the use of chemical weapons in Syria to respond with nuclear weapons should such use be clearly established. The weakest argument of all, although it's still sometimes heard, is that nuclear weapons may be needed to deter nuclear terrorism. I think when you think about it, this just doesn't have any credibility at all. Nuclear weapons are manifestly neither strategically nor tactically nor politically useful. For that purpose, terrorists don't usually have territory or industry or a population or a regular army which could be targeted with nuclear weapons. And to conduct nuclear strikes on another <coughs> state, even one demonstrably complicit in a terrorist attack really would rage huge, raise huge uh, legal, moral, political, strategic issues. If a strategic, sorry, if a nuclear strike was not contemplated in Afghanistan after 9-11, when on earth ever would it be? The more general point that runs through many of these responses to the arguments for nuclear deterrence is that nuclear weapons really are inherently unusable. And because key players know that, even if so many are reluctant to openly concede it, nuclear deterrence has nothing like the power that it's commonly assumed to have. Military commanders have long understood that there are formidable practical obstacles involved in the use, and by extension the threatened use, of these weapons at both the tactical and strategic level, not least the damage they can cause to one's own side, a phenomenon that's been described as self-assured uh, destruction, to contrast with mutually assured destruction, and the damage that can be caused to any territory being fought over. And on top of that, there is again the overall profound normative taboo, which again, as I described in my first lecture, 
really does unquestionably exist, I believe, internationally against any use of nuclear weapons, at least in circumstances, again, where the very survival of a state is not at stake. So, if nuclear weapons are for all practical purposes unusable, and the arguments for nuclear deterrence are at the very least so contestable, but the risks of something going wrong are still so high, and the consequences of that happening are so catastrophic, why don't we simply get rid of them? Why has the elimination of nuclear weapons been thought to be such an impossible dream? So that brings us to the fifth and the last crucial message on my list. The message that disarmament is actually achievable. Of course nuclear weapons can't be uninvented any more than chemical or biological weapons or any other product of human creativity can be. But like other weapons of mass destruction, they can be outlawed, as chemical weapons have been, as biological weapons have been. And despite the evident fatalism to which I referred at the outset, that nuclear weapons are always going to be with us, elimination is not a fanciful objective, even if it's not realistically a short-term one. Effectively communicating this message means mapping a credible path to zero, showing how it's possible to get to where we need to go. There are many civil society activists who advocate a very specific early target date for total elimination, like 2025 or 2030, like the Global Zero Movement, of which I'm, generally speaking, a strong supporter. But they have to wrestle, people who argue for a specific early target date for getting to zero, have to wrestle with the reality that setting dates which are seen by policymakers as impossibly ambitious, and which I fear are in fact impossibly ambitious for reasons I'll spell out in a moment, seems bound to stop policymakers listening altogether. And it's very careful to avoid being put in that situation if you're advocating something and want to be taken seriously. The International Commission on uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, whose um, report, commission on which I co-chaired uh, with my Japanese former foreign minister counterpart, Erika Kawaguchi, um, argued in our 2009 report that it was more credible and productive to focus on a minimisation target in the medium term, 2025, reducing the world's stockpile by then to around 2,000 weapons, as compared with present numbers, I've already mentioned, now 18,000. No more than 500 each for the US and Russia, and no more than 1,000 for all the other nuclear armed states combined. And to ensure that by then, and hopefully long before then, very few of those weapons were actually physically deployed, even if they existed, they weren't deployed, that none of them were on dangerously high launch alert status, and that in terms of nuclear doctrine, every nuclear armed state by then was credibly committed to no first use. Our commission resisted the temptation to put a specific date on getting to zero thereafter, because we recognise that the final step, getting from very low numbers, or much lower numbers than we have at the moment, to zero numbers, involved not just further logical stages on the same incremental continuum of a step down, <coughs> but rather uh, involved overcoming three very high hurdles, psychological hurdle, geopolitical hurdle, and a technical hurdle, as to, which, as to each of which it's frankly simply impossible now to attach a credible target date as to when that can be done. Even optimists have to be honest with ourselves about how high these hurdles are. Let me spell them out. The psychological hurdle is giving up the status and prestige that seems traditionally to have been associated with membership of the Nuclear Weapons Club, especially when it comprised only the five permanent members of the Security Council of the UN. This consideration, which I've called the testosterone factor, um, seems to have been in the case of India's decision to acquire the bomb at least as important as any anxiety about China. It certainly resonates very strongly still in France, in Russia, 
And frankly, it's hard to see any other persuasive justification for the UK still playing the Trident game. One can only hope that with uh, the current membership of the nuclear club, its cachet will diminish over time and that the general process of delegitimizing nuclear weapons will gather momentum to the point where possession of them is regarded more as a matter of embarrassment than pride. But this is certainly one of the factors we have to acknowledge that's going to make the achievement of final universal elimination very difficult. The geopolitical hurdle to be overcome is the creation of an environment in the key regions, especially of Northeast Asia and South Asia and the Middle East, stable enough for no country to have any serious concern about at least existential threats to its existence, even if not all sources of potential tension have disappeared. It's hard to argue that condition is satisfied now or to predict when it will be. But that such a world could be achieved within decades is not as fanciful as it might to some appear for all the reasons I discussed at length in my first lecture in discussing the <coughs> prospects for an end to major deadly conflict generally. What is important, I think, is not to succumb to the argument that movement towards disarmament be held completely hostage to improvement in the overall geopolitical climate. The two developments should be seen as complementary, mutually reinforcing, and properly pursued in tandem. The technical hurdle is verification and enforcement. Getting to zero, frankly, will be impossible without every state being confident that every other state is complying, that any violation of the prohibition is readily detected, and that any breakout is controllable. Those conditions don't exist at the moment. Although important work is being done by the UK, I acknowledge, in association with Norway to on verifying warhead dismantlement and with the US, UK and the US on disarmament verification technology generally. And this part of the problem may well be solved within the next decade or so. Enforcement, however, will continue to be a major stumbling block for the foreseeable future with the Security Council's credibility in this role manifestly at odds with the retention of veto powers by the Permanent Five. All that said, no institutional problem is insoluble given the political will to cooperate. And if sufficient, self-reinforcing momentum does develop behind the whole disarmament enterprise over the years ahead, this difficulty might not loom quite as large in the end game as it does now. So, that's the five messages and the arguments. How realistic are the prospects of generating that momentum. What can be done now to move things forward? Not so long ago, it was possible to be quite optimistic that things were now at last moving. <coughs> as um, in 2007, 2007 onwards, as Richard mentioned in his introduction, uh, we've had a series of, uh, first then, uh, then every year or two thereafter, a series of Wall Street Journal articles, opinion articles, by four of the hardest-nosed realists ever to hold public office, Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, Sam Nunn, and Bill Perry. And they, those op-eds were beginning to change the intellectual climate, arguing as they did that whatever positive role nuclear weapons may have played in the Cold War, and they weren't quick to deny they played any role at all, their argument was that in the present international climate, the risks of any state retaining them way outweighed any possible security reward. <coughs> then, uh, that was 2007 onwards, in 2008 we had the Global Zero worldwide civil society movement being launched. In 2009, the US had a new president totally committed intellectually and emotionally to a nuclear weapons free world. And in his Prague speech of April that year, Barack Obama gave us all immense reason to hope that the dream was on its way to becoming reality. At a more nuts and bolts level, you had this big report of my own International Commission that year, following others before it, which set out step by step a detailed, achievable global disarmament and non-proliferation agenda. Then you had the 2010 NPT conference, review conference, which unlike its failed predecessor five years earlier, um, <coughs> was a modest success, inching towards 
the implementation of that agenda. In that year, the New START Treaty was signed by the US and Russia, significantly <coughs> reducing the number of deployed strategic weapons. The balloon was flying. But since then, I think we have to say it's sunk a lot further back to Earth. By the end of last year, as fully documented in a companion volume to that report, which my, the centre I chair at the Australian National University on Nuclear Non-Proliferation Disarmament, I co-edit a big volume called Nuclear Weapons, The State of Play. This is all fully documented as at the end of 2012. <coughs> we um, had to concede that much of that sense of optimism simply evaporated. On the disarmament front, the US-Russia talks on further drawdowns were going nowhere with fundamental disagreements about ballistic missile defence and conventional arms imbalances being quite unresolved. Cautious initial moves by Washington to modify its nuclear doctrine towards accepting at least that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is to respond to nuclear threats, not those of any other kind, had also gone nowhere, inhibited by resistance from the Northeast Asian allies and by a number of very nervous Central and Eastern European NATO allies. In this respect, I have to say the long-awaited NATO deterrence and defence posture review was a very damp squib at last year's May 2012 Chicago summit, during no doing nothing whatever to reduce the salience of nuclear weapons in NATO's military posture, or really to create the conditions for any further movement between the US and Russia. And all the other nuclear armed states, particularly in Asia, comfortably sheltered behind this immobility, renewed immobility on the part of the big two. No one was signalling any kind of willingness to move to even the minimisation objective that I previously described, let alone ultimate elimination. And all the wearyingly familiar arguments about the virtue and the necessity of nuclear deterrence remain in constant use. <coughs> On other fronts, um, by the, apart from disarmament itself, by the end of last year there had been some significant progress at two big summits in Washington and Seoul on nuclear security issues, which I've already mentioned, to ensure that weapons and West weapons usable materials don't fall into the hands of rogue states or non-state terrorist actors. But there was really precious little progress on anything else. The Comprehensive Test Ban uh, Treaty remained unratified in the US Senate, a prisoner of domestic US politics. Negotiations in Geneva on a new treaty to stop further production of fissile material for nuclear weapons purposes remained paralysed. And the effort to hold a conference on a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East had ground to a complete halt, which is going to have very unhelpful consequences for North-South cooperation in the ongoing NPT review process, as we've already seen with the walkout last week by Egypt from the NPT Preparatory Committee meeting in Geneva. So, a fair bit of gloom again all around the place. But, in international relations, it's never over until it's over. And there are some signs that things may be beginning to move again at all the levels that are necessary, top-down, peer group, bottom-up. In terms of top-down leadership, President Obama made clear in his February uh, State of the Union speech his determination to restart nuclear arms reductions talks with Russia and... As you will have seen, the US has subsequently stepped back from implementing in Europe the last sensitive, particularly sensitive phase of its missile defence program, which was proving a major stumbling block to renewed negotiations. The administration has also announced that it will make Senate ratification of the CTBT a top priority, whether that has any, bears any fruit remains to be seen, but at least, at least the mood has been articulated. And if there are any achievements on these fronts, that should certainly have positive flow on effects um, elsewhere, in particular with China and India. The UK, which despite the testosterone factor, does seem to, at least this outsider, to be the least intellectually and emotionally wedded to its weapons of uh, nuclear weapons, least wedded of all the, the nuclear armed states. The UK could itself play, of course, a major leadership role by deciding to dramatically downsize its tried and armed submarine fleet. And it is encouraging to see some serious debate uh, recently recommencing on this topic. Even if it's budgetary rather than moral imperatives that are the ultimate driver of such a decision, that won't diminish the force of the example. May it happen.
At the level of peer group pressure, like-minded countries around the world are again beginning to mobilise to maintain the pressure on all the relevant actors to advance the non-proliferation and disarmament objectives agendas simultaneously. Uh, for example, there's a cross-regional grouping of 10 countries initiated by Australia and Japan, uh, which has been meeting at foreign minister level as the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative, NPDI, with a major objective being to encourage transparency in nuclear arms states reporting, with <coughs> some fruit being evident in recent P5 negotiations, some willingness to go down that particular uh, path. And in particular, on top of all that, we've got this new push being made to focus on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any nuclear weapons use, with particular um, momentum coming from Norway and Switzerland in this respect. And that's been gaining traction uh, both among UN member states and, as I'll come back to in a moment, civil society organisations. At a less formal level, I think it's also worth mentioning in the same breath as peer group pressure, a degree of momentum has been gathering behind some recently established regional leadership networks bringing together experienced and high profile current and former figures from politics, from diplomacy, from uh, the services uh, and elsewhere to inform and energise public opinion and especially to mount sort of peer level offensives against current high level policy makers about nuclear issues. The model was the um, European Leadership Network, ELN, which has been not so long ago established by Lord Des Brown, former Labor Defence Minister. It's been followed by the Asia Pacific Leadership Network, uh, APLN, which I convene from Canberra, and another such network has just been established in Latin America, for what any of this is worth. But the really crucial need, of course, is to somehow capture the imagination of publics around the world, to generate bottom-up pressure on governments, without which as I well know from 21 years in Australian politics, um, it's extremely difficult to engage government's attention and commitment. There are many civil society organisations who have tried hard in recent years to generate the necessary traction without so far much success. And the crucial need now is to really find ways of instilling new energy and focus into the campaign. One specific initiative which has been widely supported already in civil society circles and in the UN itself is to develop and promote a draft nuclear weapons convention on the model of the Ottawa Treaty on landmines and the Oslo Treaty on cluster bombs. And this could prove useful at least over the longer term in focusing and energising uh, activity on this front. I personally think actually that a more productive way forward in the shorter term might be to follow the lead of the middle powers uh, that I have mentioned who have been supporting, along with the ICRC, the Red Cross, uh, the effort to focus public and policy makers' attention on the horrific and indefensible humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Bringing that issue back to centre stage might just be the trigger that could ignite more traction at the civil society level than we've seen. My final word, achieving a nuclear weapons free world is not an impossible dream, but it will certainly be an incredibly hard slog. To get there, the critical need is to build and sustain the necessary political will through pressure applied and sustained at each of the levels that I have mentioned. But while this balloon badly needs to be reinflated, it can't just be filled with hot air. The battle to rid the world of nuclear weapons is not one that will be won by rhetoric, however powerful, or appeals to emotion, however defensible. It will be won by the power of good ideas, supported by the power of evidence-based argument in putting to the test bad and outmoded ideas. The good ideas here are simply that a nuclear weapons-free world is both overwhelmingly desirable and achievable. And the bad idea is that nuclear deterrence is a force for peace and stability in the world of today. Ideas do matter in government and international relations because they have real political force. That's not only because they can be inspirational, but because they provide a frame of reference making it easier for policymakers to take one course rather than another, enabling them to articulate clear and credible reasons. <coughs> 
to the various constituencies that they have to satisfy for the course they choose to take. Ultimately, the reason that I am an optimist here as in all the other areas that I've addressed in these lectures is that because for all that I should have known better and for all that I should have learned better, I do believe in the power of ideas, or at least good ideas, to change the world for the better. The business that all of us should be in, above all in great universities like this, is effectively developing, articulating and communicating those ideas and ensuring that they prevail. Thank you.